Father, we come to you again on this Lord's Day. We just thank you for, again, the opportunity to just come and worship you. We thank you for the message that we had this morning that you allowed me the opportunity to just preach on the, some of your books in your library. And, and that, Father, we just thank you that for those things that we said this morning, that you do remember us, you have everything written down. And, you know, th this way, you know, it's like a, they always say in court, if it wasn't written down, it, didn't, it did not happen. You know, they tell that to, to the police or whoever, and that if it didn't happen, you know, if it's not written down, well, this way here, you could say it's written down, so it did happen. So if we, you know, people try to stand before you at the different judgments, the saved and the unsaved and so forth, and you can pull out your books and say, see, here it is. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. We, we thank you, Lord, that we get, as we continue our study here on, on Revelation, that, that um, we thank you for that book that you've given us here. And we saw that one of those books was going to be the seven seals opened up, which we'll be looking at here in a little while in this study. And we just wish, Lord, that book never would have to be opened up. But we know that because a man's sin, that just like with in the days of Noah, when you, you had to bring about the flood, you had to do it because you are a righteous judge and, and, and a righteous God, and that you, you know, must do these things, not because you want to, but because it's necessary. And so, Father, we just pray that you bless bless all those that are here and listening online. And ask that you bless me and just give me the words and understanding as we continue in our study in the book of Revelation that I have the proper understanding so I can teach them properly because I'll admit that I do not necessarily claim to be an expert and know it all, but I'm trying to uh, understand the words so that it can be, because I know that the time that this book is on, the time is around the corner but very soon that this book will be fulfilled. So it'll no longer be prophetic, but it'll be past. And so Father, I just ask that you, again, Bless this service and, and, and your servant. And I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As you said, we're going to be continuing our study on the book of Revelation. So this will be Revelation part three. You know, we've been looking at the, the uh, background and the introduction. Sometimes it takes me a little longer, just depending on the book and what's going on, and how long it takes to get through the introduction. So I want to continue a little bit more. I did not have a whole lot more on the introduction before we uh, get started looking at the verses. You know, I'm not going to repeat some of the stuff we did, you know, we had said, but I had mentioned that there was basically the four uh, beliefs on what people believe the, the uh, revelation is and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, when it was written and some of those things. But now the book of Daniel is the Old Testament equivalent of Revelation, which speaks of many of the same events. Now, many, you'll see that when we start going through our study, that I'll have us going back to Daniel at times, as well as some other places in the Old Testament. But, you know, Daniel has a lot of that relation. You know, eventually at some point, we may go through the book of Daniel as well. So, but you're going to see that they're connected. You know, this was kind of, you know, Daniel kind of got a little bit of some of the things and he got it from a little bit different perspective and so forth. But, you know, he, you know, that's where we actually get, we know how long the tribulation is, the seven years. It never tells us that in the book of Revelation. You have to go back to the, to Daniel to, to find that out. You know, so people always say, well, it doesn't say that, you know, it's going to be seven years long. Yes, it does. It's just, it's like, it goes back to what I said in my morning sermon that, God expects us to read his book, but we also have to study his book. So it's not like just going and say, all right, well, I read Revelation. Well, that's great. But you need to read other things, including Daniel, so that you have the understanding and you can put all the pieces together. God, most of the time, never gives you the complete story in any one book because he does that on purpose because he expects you and wants you to go and read all of them and to then study it and piece it all together so that, you know, he's, he's not going to just hand everything on, on a platter. He wants you to do a little bit of research and study because that way he knows you love him and, and, and so forth. You know, God's just not going to just hand you everything. But as I said, so Daniel ha has a lot of the same events in, in different perspectives. But just like Revelation, much doubt was cast on when Daniel was actually written 
as the haters just could not accept the accuracy of Daniel and coming from God. So they tried to deny its timeline. You know, they, they, there was a lot of people that said, well, Daniel didn't really write Daniel because a lot of these things, you know, the accuracy when he predicted the four kingdoms of the, uh, you know, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans, and he talks about all those empires. They were so accurate, you know, like how, how um, the Greek empire, after the death of uh, Alexander the Great, you know, then it split into the different kingdoms, you know, the portions, and, you know, the different ones were in charge of different things, and one would be more powerful and all that kind of stuff. You know, the guy from uh, Egypt, can't remember his name right now, Ptolemy or whatever it is. Then, you know, these things were so accurate that people say, well, it had to be written after all these things happened. No, it was written just like God said, because like, as I've said many, millions of times, God created time. God is not part of time. So for him, those things had already happened. The tribulations already happened to him. That's why he could show John, you know, what we're going to be seeing here, because these things have already happened. So, you know, it's it just like with the book of Revelation. You know, there was a lot of people that they, they tried to deny Daniel or try to twist things around. And, the, and when we start looking at some of the stuff, then they'll say that the um, some of those things that already happened and it was really, you know, epiphanies and, and you know, some of these other things that had happened, and, you know, they were talking about and, you know, it's just their way of, you know, always trying to deny deny stuff. But, you know, they did not want to, want to, you know, see what it shows. But now Ezekiel also has much to say about the future millennial temple. So Ezekiel, you know, has the whole, from uh, chapter 40 all the way to the end of the book, 48, it basically talks about all about the millennial temple, you know, during that thousand year kingdom, uh, kingdom reign there of, of Jesus here on earth. So, you know, there's other books, you know, there's certain places that have different parts of Revelation in there and so forth. You know, the, Daniel is more of dealing with during the tribulation. Ezekiel, that part is more during the millennium and, and, and so forth. And there's, you know, there's places that speak of, you know, like Ezekiel also talks about, you know, we've studied on that in chapters 38 and 39 about the battle of Gog and Magog. You know, that stuff's all going to be, you know, more than likely going on during the tribulation and so forth as well so you know it does you know we will see ezekiel speaks a little bit about about that and you know there's other little places like a matthew and places like that but you know daniel is kind of like that main one where it, you know has a lot of stuff that is related to to revelation so we'll be seeing that but most people whether they are saved or unsaved have heard of at least some of the events such as the antichrist and the mark of the beast and many are interested, even if they do not believe in the book. Revelation deals with the events we refer to as end time events. The Roman Catholic Bibles used to refer to Revelation as apocalypse, but it is rightly called Revelation as found in the King James Bible. You know, and even some of the other modern Bibles have, have used that. But, you know, even Roman Catholic Bibles now are switching to Revelation because they're trying to bring in that one world religion. And so, you know, they're trying to, you know, they change some of their names and different things and stuff to try to make them look like, you know, they're one of the, you know, same Bibles. But trust me, they're still, still corrupt. And they push their own false doctrines and so forth, you know, such as baptism saves and different things like that. Now, you know, as I said, you know, many people have, you know, they know, you know, even if you're not Christians, you know, I've, I've said people have heard most of the things they know about the market of beast, the Antichrist, things like that. You know, you see people all the time, even on, you know, different things, they'll, they'll, they'll like almost mock it or whatever, you know, or they'll talk about different things. You know, I've, I've hand, hand out, told you I hand out tracts and stuff like that and have a track ministry. You know, I've handed out a, a bunch of them before and, you know, I've had people actually come up to me, hey, do you have any on the end times? Hey, do you have anything on, you know, different things like this relating to the tribulation or different things like, you know, they're going on. And they weren't necessarily Christians. They, you know, they were just, people want to know about these things. You know, part of it is just man's um, curiosity, but it's also, I think, you know, you know, deep down inside, you know, everybody knows that there really is a God. It tells us that in Romans, that we know there's a God. And I think there's a part of them that really wants to know 
what they're going to be going through because they know they're not saved and they know they're going to be going through this tribulation. So they, instead of, you know, repenting and turning to Jesus so they can avoid it, then they just like, well, I want to kind of know what's going on. So, you know, but it, the, so most people, you know, they, they know, they may twist things and maybe get confused or something like, oh, what side is the mark of the beast on or something like that, but, or exactly what it is. But, you know, most people, they've heard of, you know, at least those two terms, the Antichrist and the mark of the beast and, you know, revelation in general. They, they know what you're talking about, or you, you hear the, the, the name, even the apocalypse that the Roman Catholics used. And they, they know that these things mean like, oh, bad things are going to happen on earth or whatever. You know, they, they always talk about, you know, even, even uh, sometimes when some bad disaster hits, oh, it was an apocalyptic event or something like that, that, you know, they try to, you know, they don't know what an apocalyptic event is until the tribulation comes. Then, then they can, you know, maybe call it that. But, but like I said, the rightful name is just like what's found in the King James Bible. It's, it's Revelation, not Apocalypse. Now, the book of Revelation focuses on the Lord Jesus Christ and his glory as God. It is about his authority as judge against sin, his coming kingdom, where he will reign as king of kings and lord of lords, as well as the future creator of a new heavens and a new earth. You know, so there's a lot within this book. You know, everybody thinks it's always, you know, we think of the tribulation, which, you know, mainly it is. But, you know, we're going to see that I told you that part of it's about the church history. Part of it's about the tribulation. Part of it's going to be about the millennium. And then also about the, the new heavens and the new earth that's going to happen. So, you know, there's a lot of things in here. You know, it's God's judgments against sin. You'll see where... You know, the great white throne judgment where everybody has to, you know, and the, and the believers, you know, during this time, this when the believers were standing at the Bema uh, seat of judgment. And, you know, the unbelievers at the great white throne, you know, all these things, are, you know, are, are found within here. You know, as I said, I believe the battle of Gog and Magog, there's really two of them. There's that one and then the one at the end of the millennium and so forth. So, you know, there's a lot more in here than just the Antichrist and, and the Mark of the Beast type thing. You know, but we see that, that God, you know, Jesus is all these things. You know, we'll read about King of Kings and Lord of Lords as we go through later on. But Revelation shows the true character of Jesus rather than his lowly estate as a man in his first coming who bore the sins of the world so that man might receive salvation. Now, he is in places referred to as that lamb, as we saw this morning, as the lamb that was slain. But as I said this morning, so, you know, it does mention a little bit about, you know, what he did here in his first coming. And we see that, you know, we, it, we're going to see there, it says in Revelation, that he washed us in his blood because of what he did do in that first coming. You know, he was slain, but I, like I said, he is no longer dead. You know, he is alive. Unlike other founders of religions such as Muhammad or Buddha or whatever, they're all dead, come and gone. You know, they're burning in hell. But yet, um, Jesus is alive. He's, you know, living, you know, he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. But we're going to see the true character that, that uh, you know, in Revelation. We're going to see his true glory that, like they saw there at the Mount of Transfiguration. You know, Peter, James, and John, they kind of saw some of that, you know, got a glimpse of it. Well, that's what John will see here. And, you know, that's what we're going to see. And then now you're going to see, where, like I said, this time when he comes back the second time, he'll no longer come as this weak little lamb that gets slain. You know, he'll be coming as a lion of Judah, and he's going to, you know, be that judge. You know, the first time he came as Savior, the second time he's going to come as the judge. That's when he'll, you know, have the judgment of the, the sheep and the goats and, you know, so forth. And, you know, we're going to see all this. So, you know, the true nature, Revelation really shows that true nature of who Jesus really is, you know, that. You know, the, the first coming and the other ones were just more of, you know, showing him as more of the, the God-man. But yet, now we're going to see him as, you know, his full deity. But Revelation shows Jesus in his full power and authority as God and how one day all will bow down before him and call him Lord, including Satan. You know, the day will come. We're going to look at a couple verses here before we get started. But the day will come that, all, including Satan, will bow down before God, you know, for Jesus, and will call him Lord. You know, that we're going to see that these judgments that are going to be coming, you know, they're going to show this power of Jesus as God. 
you know, that they, they, you cannot do all these things. You know, we, we mentioned it before, but uh, we'll get into it in a little bit. But we're going to see that, that um, well, I'm not, I'll wait on it because we're going to get into it here shortly. But but there's there's a, like a pecking order or whatever that, you know, you're going to see here. And you're going to see Jesus in his full glory as God. But let's look up a couple verses here. Look at Romans chapter 14, verse 11. So keep your finger there in Revelation and then turn to Romans. And, and, it is, and remember, it's, I've heard this too. You know, it's, it's Revelation. It's the book of Revelation or Revelation. It's not Revelations like I hear people say all the time. It is Revelation. You know, just like Psalms is the book of Psalms, but each one is an individual Psalm. It's not Psalms 23. It's Psalm 23. Romans chapter 14, verse 11. Romans chapter 14, verse 11. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So every knee and you will know, bow to him, and every tongue will, will confess. And then turn to Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. So Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. But as I said, you know, about revelation, you know, there was one revelation. There was not revelations given. You know, this is one revelation of all of these things that John sees that we're going to go through in this book. You know, it's singular. You know, people need to try to, you know, be obedient to what God has in his word and not just add their own little things. You know, it may sound like a little nitpicking thing, but it, it, it's not being accurate. We want it, When we're talking God's word, we want to be as accurate as possible. So look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, talking about Jesus, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. You know, we see there in verse 10, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, you know, of things in heaven. You know, that includes, you know, now, you know, Christians and so forth that, that are up there. But that includes angels, both holy and unholy. Things in the earth, you know, of course, that's people that are still alive, you know, and so, so forth. Things under the earth, you're talking about those in hell. And you're talking about, you know, even those angels locked up in the bottomless pit and, and Satan himself, you know, all these things that the day will come that whether they're holy angels, on you know, evil angels, whatever, everybody will bow down before God and will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And this will be done to the glory of God the Father because this is his, you know, Jesus is his son. And, you know, this, people need to understand the seriousness of this and that, you know, how God is, you know, Jesus is God. You know, my ministry, that's why I call it Jesus is God and Lord Ministries. Because so many people try to deny Jesus is God. They try to deny he's Lord. He is both. He's 100% God. He's still 100% man. But he's also Lord. He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And one day, everyone will bow down and call him Lord. Now, before we move on, one last thing that... Uh, you know, there are some people, different theologians, different people that have done some research and stuff, and they say that the book of Revelation, you know, we always say that the, the Old Testament was written originally in Hebrew and with parts of Daniel in um, Aramaic, and then the New Testament was all written in Greek. But there are some theologians that have done a little bit of research and so forth, and they say it's possible. I'm not 100% convinced. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm not saying they're right. I have to do more research on my own. But that they say that actually the book of Revelation, along with Matthew and Hebrews, were originally written in Hebrew and then translated into Greek. Now, like I said, I have not going to say that that's true because I do not know yet. You know, I haven't done enough research and there's not been enough evidence found to confirm any of that. But I just want to throw that out there because sometimes people say, well, why is this written this way or why is this that or whatever? Because, you know, maybe, you know, like I said, you're looking at it. Remember, John was a Hebrew, you know, he, so 
things are going to be different. And, you know, and, and there is some logic that makes some sense to them having been written in that. Of course, Matthew was written to the Hebrews to show Jesus as the king, you know, the coming Messiah. So, you know, and he's right, you know, Hebrews was written to the book, you know, was written to the Hebrews. So it makes sense, you know, that just like Paul, when, you know, that he spoke, you know, I, I was telling some people, I said that, uh, you know, people say that translations cannot be in, in, that be inspired. And I've told you before, the King James Bible is the inspired word of God found in English. It, uh, Mo, uh, if you remember Paul in, the, in Acts, then, you know, there was that one point when he goes and he gives his testimony of how he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus and so forth. And he talks to the, to the, the Hebrews or the Israelites. And he, you know, normally he's speaking Greek or whatever. But then he goes and he, you know, he starts speaking to them in Hebrew. And they were kind of shocked. They didn't, you know, they didn't expect him to speak in Hebrew. So that made them listen more because they're like, well, he's speaking to us in our own language. Now they still didn't believe him. But the point is he was speaking to them in Hebrew. But yet people claim that, you know, Acts was only written in, in Greek, which I think everybody pretty much agrees with that. Well, that means that God had to take Hebrew and it was inspired what Paul spoke and then translated it into Greek. So he could take Hebrew and translate it into Greek, which then now that original is boldly inspired. Same thing with the um, Moses when he was at the 10 plates, when he was before Pharaoh. Of course, you know, growing up, Moses spoke Egyptian. Well, Moses, he would not, you know, he... Obviously, he could speak Hebrew as well, but he would not be going for Pharaoh and speaking to him in Hebrew. You know, first of all, whether Pharaoh even understood it or not, but Pharaoh would not lower himself to speak what was considered his, his servants or whatever. That he was not going to speak their language. Moses would have spoke Egyptian that he knew growing up, spoke that to the Pharaoh. So, you know, so it shows you, even though it doesn't say in Scripture, that God took the words that Moses spoke to Pharaoh that were in Egyptian they were inspired and took them and inspired them in the translation of Hebrew. So if God can do that with Hebrew and, and Greek, then he, you know, so, um, I mean, Egyptian and Hebrew, he can do the same thing, take Hebrew and Greek and translate it and inspire it in to the English. So people always say, well, you need to go to the Hebrew or the Greek and to really know all the nuggets and all these things. No, you only wanna know what the Hebrew or the Greek says in the original? open up the King James Bible and it's exactly what you'll find that it says in the Hebrew or the, the Greek. So, you know, like I said, whether, you know, it just makes sense that in some sense that there is possibility that they really were written in Hebrew, those three books. As I said, I'm not going to say it flat out that they were, they were not because honestly, I'm not sure myself, you know, I mean, for right now I'm going to stick with the Greek, but I think there is that possibility that, you know, it'd be interesting if we ever, you know, come across stuff and 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 see what 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 happens. But um, you know, just I just want to point that out, just in case somebody ever has never heard that or just or has heard it and they're just wondering what I thought. And and also just again show you that you know the King James Bible is inspired. You know, despite what people say. You know, and that's very important because there's a lot of people that use the King James Bible, but they do not necessarily believe it's inspired. And that's why people go from one church to another. They all of a sudden, whatever reason, they leave that church and go somewhere else. Well, then that church is using some other Bible, and they're pretty much like, well, whatever. You know, my pastor at the other church, he thought it was the best version of this and that. You know, it was great, but he didn't believe it was inspired. So it's just not really inspired. I can kind of use whatever version. But that, that's the thing. If you teach them that it's an inspired word to God and teach it because that's the truth, not just to teach it, then they'll be a little bit more hesitant on, well, you know, that's supposed to be the you know, inspired words of God. So I don't want to, you know, return from these. And and the, the thing is, um, you know, what people need to understand, that's why I call it the King James Bible. It's not the King James Version. It's the King James Bible because there is only one Bible. There are no versions. There's the King James Bible and there's counterfeits. And it's, that's all there are. It's just that simple. There's no, there's no middle ground. There's no alternatives. You've got the King James Bible and anything else is a counterfeit. Let's move on to um, start looking at this verse from verse. So let's go to Revelation chapter 1. So we'll go to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. 
the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel, excuse me, unto his servant John. So the book of Revelation is about the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to reveal to John the Apostle by an angel. So we see that the revelation went from God to Jesus Christ to an angel to John who gave it to the church. But, you know, it all starts with God. You know, there's that hierarchy. You know, it goes from God the Father, and then it went down to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who then gave it to one of his holy angels, who then he had him to deliver it to John, who then John was to give it to the church. And remember, unlike in Daniel's book, which we'll look at later on, Daniel was told to seal it up until the time of the end. We are now living in that time of the end. That's why it's been unsealed, and we understand it, and we're going to use it to, well, as we study through the book of Revelation. But John was never told to seal his up. He was told to go and tell his to the church so that we would be aware of these things and we could help try to lead people to the Lord rather than having them go through these things. But, you know, we're, you know, to, to John is to, to spread, the, you know, the word on his. But, you know, just remember, there's that kind of that hierarchy that, you know, angels are below God and, and, and so forth. And right now, angels are above us, but the day will come and we'll be above angels. The name of the book is given to us. Revelation means revealing a message by God that had been hidden. So revealing it makes it known. So, you know, there was a message that had been hidden, but now God's revealing it to us. You know, as I said, through this order of, you know, Jesus Christ, this the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, he's going to reveal it. It's coming right from Jesus Christ himself that he's going to reveal it. You know, but, you know, it shows us which God gave unto him. So we know, you know, God the Father gave this to Jesus Christ here, and then, you know, he delivers, as I said, to the angel and then to his servant, John, and so forth. You know, and servant here, you know, it's not slave like a lot of people say. You know, servant is, you know, John willingly wanted to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, he was not forced to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. But so we see that the name itself is given. So that's why I say, too, you know, this when people call it the apocalypse, you know, like the Roman Catholics, that's an improper term. You know, the, the name of the book is Revelation. It's even given to us right in this first verse. You know, they don't go around changing it to, you know, different things. So it's just, you know, we need to, again, go with what God gives us, you know, not what man gives us. Much of the revealing will be visual, and we will see that John was told to write down what he saw. You know, so we're going to see that, you know, John was told to write down these things. You know, that, you know, that a lot of this is all visual visions and so forth, that these are things that he saw. So, you know, John was actually there. You know, he sees these things. But John was given this revelation for the purpose to give to fellow Christians who were servants of Jesus so that they might know things that must shortly come to pass. You know, as I said, remember this says they're shortly to come to pass to them. And we'll look at that here soon. But, but God wanted John to tell everyone the things that would soon come to pass, whereas Daniel was told to seal up his book until the time of the end. You know, I said that a while ago, but keep your finger there. I want to go to Daniel. I said we'll be going to Daniel throughout this study. Let's go to the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 9. And I want you to see this. See the difference here because we're going to see that, you know, John is to write these things down and to tell the church Whereas Daniel was to keep these things sealed up until the time of the end. As I said, we are now in that time of the end. And that's one reason why we understand the book of Daniel better than people did in the past. Because it was only meant for people living in our time. But Daniel chapter 12 and verse 9. So Daniel chapter 12 and verse 9. And he said... Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. You know, so because Daniel, if you went back and looked in verse 8, he asked, you know, he, you know he, I don't understand these things. And God said, 
it's not for you to understand, Daniel. They seal the book up. It's for the people their time on the end. They will understand because they're the ones that's going to be living through this. So, you know, but as I said, that Daniel was the Old Testament equivalent of Revelation. Yet in Daniel's day, it was not time for people to know and understand the time of the end. The time of the end or last days or end times, as we call it, you know, it's called different things. You know, the time of the end, last days in scripture, we refer to it as end times. Started with the res resurrection of Jesus, but especially applies to our day as we are living in the last hours before the rapture and return of Jesus. You know, technically the last the end times or whatever, if you look at scripture, it started at the resurrection of Jesus. You know, those the end times, the last days started then because, um, but what we refer to as like the end times, the last days, and like what they're referring to here in Daniel, it's more of like literally the time we're living in now. You know, we're in the last hours before the time comes, before the tribulation starts and all that. You know, what's going to happen here in the book of Revelation? As I said, you know, we're in those last um, hours, you know, we're living in those times now before the rapture and return of Jesus. Now, in God's eyes, it has been only about two days since Jesus was here on earth for the first time. So to him who knows the end, then we were living in the last days, as I believe the millennium will not start until the end of these two days, with the millennium being the seventh day since God created everything. You know, I've said it before, but I believe the earth is on a seven-day cycle, just like that's why you know I have the creation. There's six days of what would be the work, and the the seventh day will be the millennial. That's the rest. That was the Sabbath. That was the rest. Well, that's your millennium. That's when Jesus will be bringing that peace here on earth and and so forth. And that'll be the seventh day. You know, we have not. The earth is younger than six thousand years old. We're getting close to six thousand, but we're not having. We have not reached six thousand yet. And I believe when we reach that 6,000, that'll start the millennium. You know, you have to have, of course, the tribulation of the seven years before that. So, you know, we're getting close to that time because that it's that 6,000 year period is about up. So, but as I said, so, you know, for God's eyes, you know, if that's true, then you have the six days of work or whatever. You know, we'd already gone through four of them by the time the resurrection of Jesus came. So there was only two days left. So, you know, you're over half the point through. So now you would be in the last days. Or the end time. No, you're down to the final two days, basically, in God's eyes. Well, look at Psalm 90 and verse 4. So Psalm 90 and verse 4. Psalm 90, verse 4. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past, and as a watch in the night. You know, for him, you know, it's just like yesterday. You know, that thousand years past, well, that was just yesterday. You know, it, it, we're going to see the New Testament equivalent of this. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Remember, most verses have... At least one cross reference somewhere, whether it's you know Old Testament, New Testament type thing, or it could be in the same uh, testament. But you know, God tries to always have two or three witnesses. You know, once in a while, there's just a one verse on something. But so look at Second Peter chapter three and verse eight. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. You know, so again, in his eyes, the earth's only six days old, you know, six thousand years. That's why I said before my study on Genesis that that um, Adam, you know, he, God said, in the day that you eat of this tree, thou shalt die. In God's eyes, he did die in the same day. He did die spiritually at that moment, he ate that, you know, they ate of that fruit, and, you know, he died, and, you know, had to be, you know, at that point would have to be, you know, saved, just like the rest of us, but he also, in God's eyes, physically died that same day, because Adam only lived to be 930 years old, so did the oldest person was Methuselah, 969 years, in God's eyes, all of those never made it to a thousand years, so all of them died 
within one day. You know, they never made it. You know, so Adam, he died that same day that he was born in God's eyes. You know, not born, you know, not born, and he rather he was created. Sorry about that. That you know, God created him when he created him from the dust of the ground. But this first here, you know, speaking back in Revelation chapter one, verse one, that says the events of Revelation must shortly come to pass, showing how in God's eyes the time is soon. You know, the phrase must shortly come to pass also shows how nearly all of Revelation was prophetic at the time it was written, starting with the with the first verse. You know, I said that about 95% of it was prophetic, even at the time when John wrote it, and still most of it's prophetic in our day. That uh, you know that but God said that the time, you know, I want you to write these things down, these things must shortly come to pass. Because as I said, in God's eyes, he's like, Well, in about two days, these things are gonna happen. You know, it's been roughly almost 2,000 years. Not quite, but it, you know, in God's eyes, as I said, it's basically, he hasn't even completed two days yet. So, you know, that'd be like us saying, okay, well, Tuesday, let's, uh, this big thing's going to happen. Well, that's not that far from now. You know, Tuesday, that's just a couple of days. Well, God's eyes, it's the same thing for him. What's going to happen in Revelation, which is not that far away from what he was telling John. Well, Revelation has been of interest to many Christians over the years, but for much of the church's history, it was either ignored or neglected by most since it seemed to make no sense and it did not seem important compared to spreading the gospel. You know, we're going to continue that thought next week, but, you know, I'll probably mention that little sentence again. But I want to kind of, it's kind of changing a little bit the thought we were talking about, but we're about out of time. So we'll, uh, Pick it up there, but just remember that you know we're talking about the time that come you know shortly come to pass. That you know these things in God's eyes were in that end times, and we know that there are other places that we're very truly in the end times. You know those last days, those last moments. You know they always had the the during the Cold War they had the the atomic bomb clock thing that would say you know we're you know two minutes from doomsday, you know, or, you know, if it hit midnight, you know, that would be doomsday, you know, there'd be nuclear war everywhere, all this stuff going on, you know, and then other times things would mellow out a little bit, okay, we're about five minutes till midnight now, or, you know, whatever, they kind of move it a little bit, depending on situations, and, well, we're that, we're, not, we're that's how we are now with what's going to happen in this book of Revelation, that, that we're those, on those final minutes, an hour, or whatever, so, you know, we're not far away, so, you know, keep these things in mind, pay attention to the news, listen to the key words that people talk about, the Great Reset, the the one world government, the, you know, one world religion, you know, we're all global citizens, or we're all global this, or, you know, listen to this stuff, and, and you'll see that these things are going to be coming into place, that we're going to be talking about, you know, what the Antichrist wants to do with Mark and Beast and that type of stuff. Let's, we'll go ahead and stop here, and I'll finish up the rest of this verse next week. We'll continue uh, the rest of verse 1 next week. Father, we thank you for this time you've given us here to just, again, continue to study your word. We do thank you for this book of Revelation. We do thank you that you do not seal up this book, unlike you had done with Daniel in the day that it was written. And we thank you that the, the book of Daniel has been unsealed for us because we are living in a time, so... Now we can start to understand it. It's like Revelation. It's not always easy to understand everything, but it's a lot easier for us to see the things that are going through it now because we are in those days, in, in those last days, the last hours, and the last minutes that, Lord, these things are, are not far around the corner. And, Father, it's exciting to see these things unfolding, but at the same time, it's it's frustrating to, to see how wicked and sinful the world has become and how much they have rejected your son, Jesus, and that that uh, how people just as a whole do not even want to hear the gospel. That, that uh, We pray, Lord, that for a great revival, that that we pray that, you know, this revival is supposed to be going on there in um, Kentucky, that, that, it's, that it's real, Lord, that, that it's not just uh, some show being put on or just whatever. We pray that, that, that this is a real revival, Lord, that, that you'll go and and touch these people's hearts and that pe many might truly get saved and, and that we they could sp if it's real, that it could spread throughout the nation and throughout the world. And so, Father, 
we just ask that you be with each and every one. Bless the rest of their day and, and bless their week, the, the rest of their week. And we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.